Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Hunstead. Thank you for joining us for night two of the endurance event. Um, I hope some of you were able to join last night. We had Scott Frey and Jim Vance and Ben Canute on for great conversations. We will be sharing recordings of these events about a month after um, the event ends tomorrow night. But tonight we have a special guest. Matt Fitzgerald, no, I'm just kidding. Lauren Fleshman, <laughs> we all know that, um, but we're really here for Lauren. So tonight we're going to be talking about community and um, a little bit about Lauren's journey. And with that, Matt, I'll let you take it away. Right on. Uh, thanks so much. Hannah, um, where are you? <laughs> I am in Chicago. I know I'm usually in my like little closet of an office and it was nice and sunny today. So I pulled my computer out to the dining room, but now it's dark out. Classic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't okay. figure Where it out. You, Matt? What's that? Where are you? Yeah. Good question. Um, I am in the casita in the house that is dream run camp in Flagstaff, Arizona. So um, because the business model is that people live in my house with me and just train and live the life. Um, you know, we're, we're in the, we're in the guest quarters, my wife and I, uh, nice. I, don't, I don't know how I got her to sign up for this, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like a nice space. Yeah, no, no, it's very comfy. Um, it's like a, like a one bedroom apartment basically. Well, sounds like you're building community on like a really intimate okay. scale. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. I hope I hope to get into this, uh, and we will. Um, so, for starters, um, I remember meeting you uh, in the green room before we went live. You you mentioned uh, what well, you said. It was nice to meet me in this e space. Um, I remember one time being in the same physical space with you. It was at Dathan Ritzenhain's house in. 2007 after the U.S. Cross Country Championships. Um, oh wow! Yeah. Probably made no impression on you, but uh, <laughs> but yes, I remember, remember meeting you then. And I thought it would just be a nice entry point for the conversation. Yeah. For you, if you can rewind your mind back to where you were in life mm -hmm. then. In 2007, yeah. So I had just moved to Eugene, Oregon. And, um, and I was, and I made that move mainly to have community because before that I was trying to do my own thing, um, kind of as a independent professional athlete and training in different camps, moving around the country and the world for a couple months at a time here or there, but I didn't have a home base. I didn't have roots and I'm a person that can handle a lot of traveling. I enjoy that, but it, it definitely start started to get to be not have any consistent community, um, but I did build it, build little communities wherever I went, and and those years before two thousand seven uh, are full of like adventure and and great memories and like kind of quick and fast relationships that you build, but then you like don't see each other ever again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then yeah, I, I built roots in Eugene, and that's when I I started by connecting to professional athletes and having a team on Oregon Track Club Elite. It was my first time as a professional really training with a with a team of people with a similar vision. Yep. All right. Well, yeah. we're, we're, so that was where I was at. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, we're right on theme because um, you mentioned it was like a, a, a move where community seeking was kind of the rationale or at least a, a part of the calculus. Um, yes. Yeah. But, it was really important. It was I needed stability. I needed, I couldn't do uh, like, sometimes I'd get to work out with people when I was traveling around the world as an independent person. But a lot of times I was just on my own, just grinding things out by myself. And I know some people enjoy that and I enjoy that every now and then, but not as the norm. Um, and just being able to have people that know you, that you can, you don't have to start over every couple months, like with the basics of who you are and you get people that can pick up where you left off, like, a month ago and then a year ago and then two years ago and then you just get to build this nice interweaving of your lives with this one thing you share in common you have at least one thing in common right running yeah. um and you may have others but it's still just such a really cool place where you may have running in common but not much else and yet you spend hours together right yeah and those are not 
everyday hours either. <laughs> no. Um, so, um, so when uh, I had uh, nominated you as a speaker for this year's uh, endurance mm -hmm. event, uh, I read and enjoyed your book, um, Good for a Girl. And, um, and so when Hannah and I discussed like, all right, so, you know, what, what should the theme be for me? Like that, you know, this theme of community, creating community, uh, nurturing community um, is what jumped to mind. Like, it's like, if, if, if there were no audience for this and it was just like me having a chance to talk to you, that's what I would want to talk to you about, mm. um, you know, first it, it, at least. Um, but when uh, I think it was Hannah probably who passed this on to you, you know, that that's what I thought would be a cool theme. Um, what were your initial thoughts? Like, did that resonate? You're like, oh yeah, that's definitely a big theme in my story or in my mission. Um, I'm curious. Yeah. I do not know the answer to this question. Well, I was I was gonna ask you what it was about the book that made you think about that because I know that I, for me, as I go through my journey in my story of my career, um, I kind of move. I, I fall in love with running because of a team and this feeling of belonging, but then as I become more competitive and singularly focused on excellence, people become more disposable than in, in, uh, in that journey, like that kind of lonelier and lonelier journey. And then the year that we opened this conversation with is when I kind of like finally had realized that that was not a sustainable way to go or a way I wanted to live. And I wanted more out of life and more out of my sport than that. And so that, that year that we met was the beginning of an opening of a funnel. Mm -hmm. So it started with an elite running community and coaches, but then I, I needed more and wanted more than just this little group of people pursuing the same thing. I wanted um, a broader running community of people that loved the sport and had, and frankly had a lot more joy in it than most of the elite athletes that I, I was training with. And I was finding myself being very inspired by the local running community in Eugene that did road races of all ages. People, there was this running group called Flyers, people in their 20s up through, I think our oldest member was in their 60s. And a teammate of mine, Stephanie Bruce, coached this group once a week. And um, and so I would show up sometimes and got invited to social functions. And I was like, man, these people are having a blast. And like, it lit me up and fueled me to go back to kind of the grind of my goals. And um, and then when Stephanie moved, I was like, can I take over? Like, can I coach this team? I'd love to be more involved in this. And um, and that group is what really truly made Eugene feel like home for the first time. Uh -huh. And that was the, that was the hardest part to leave. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, for me, like, I mean, you, you asked the question, like, why did that theme like mm -hmm. jump out to me? Um, I think, you know, like, you know, there are some people on this earth, like who have a mission um, and, or like have a main mission and that was a big takeaway from reading your book for me is like, like, this is a woman on a mission. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, like it's a very clear mission. Uh, and it's yeah. like, probably not going to change in 10 years. Uh, like mm -hmm. that type, type of thing. And often like when, when it, you have like, you know, a person who just has an authentic mission doing for Instagram likes, it's just like, mm -hmm. it's something, you, it's something you got to do. Like often that is rooted in, your own needs or maybe your, your own unmet needs. And so I saw mm -hmm. that in your, in your story too, where it's just like, um, you know, you, you might, you didn't get enough of certain things at the right times. Yeah. And that fed into like this becoming important for you as you pivot toward more of like a, you know, um, a paying it forward type of a mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that being the person you needed when you were younger right. um, and trying to, I'm definitely very driven by that. I mean, you, you nailed it. And the, the mission of my book being, how can we, how can we meet the needs better of, in, in my case, or what drives me right now, um, female athletes that are coming through the youth sports system all the way up through professional, all the way through recreational, like sports aren't built around the female body and female development. Um, and so, yeah, just, and, and my book is meant to bring to life what happens, uh, what harms are caused when you don't consider the norms and needs of like half the population, oh. what happens to that group. And, um, and I, and it, I think I felt so driven because 
these sports spaces are so rich and have so much potential to like positively impact our lives. And so when there's things that are ubiquitous that are taking away from that, that are avoidable and fixable, changeable things, I just think like to me, it's, it's not discouraging. It's, it's, it's actually like really encouraging. Cause I'm like, well, we can identify these things. And if we can move those away, if we can kind of push those things aside collectively and decide we care about them, then the power of these sports communities gets even bigger. Like it actually can fulfill its entire potential. That fire gets all the oxygen it really needs and yeah. deserves. And, and then we really thrive. Right. And we all know if we're involved in sports that our sports spaces, when they're healthy, they fuel us and send us out into the rest of our lives, our work, our families, and we're better. We're better in those spaces because of the health of our sports space. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who Hannah, she's rolling her eyes, I quote him all the time, but uh, he, he wrote, there are no philosophies, only philosophers. And the point he was making was that People's core convictions, not just philosophers, but like anyone with core convictions, it, it is rooted in experience. It, it, like it's an expression of, of who you are. Um, and uh, so looking back at your own, you know, your own history, like what do you think should have been, I don't want to say wish was different, but like think like should have been different at at various stages in your development, that is the kind of thing you're trying to correct for in the future? Yeah, well, I think it, it really starts from about age 12, when, because before age 12, there's no sex-based differences in sports performance. So it's really once we get to that puberty, why in the road, right? And female bodies develop differently than male bodies, but sports systems are built around a male body norm of linear improvement, work harder, get better, you get out what you put in, all these kind of like motivational sayings that um, are pretty dang true for male bodied people as they go through puberty up to whenever their prime is. And um, for female bodied people, that's just not the case. I mean, that is not the norm. There are some people that have that experience, but instead of a line, it's much more of a wave. And in my book, I call it the female performance wave because it doesn't have a name. I just named it that because it, it's so, yeah. <laughs> even though it's so common, it has no language. Yeah. And, um, and so starting at age 12, the first place that that shows up in female bodies with breast development, which is about a year and a half to two years before the menstrual cycle starts. And that's a, usually around middle school. And we know that girls are dropping out of sports at twice to three times the rate of boys at that age, around age 13, 14. And we lose half of girls in sports by age 17. And this is despite 50 years of of like legislation and collective excitement and enthusiasm about getting opportunities for girls in sports. Like we, you can give it to them, but if you're not providing something that is, that feels good to their bodies, um, they're not gonna stick around, right? And so what one thing just for like a very concrete example, the very first thing we could do is provide a free sports bra for every middle school person that has boobs or that could get them. Like just, to, we should provide it as standard issued equipment. I have two kids and they both play soccer. One's a boy, one's a girl. Their a sports bra should be part of the equipment issued. You should get a jersey, shorts, and a sports bra. Um, and the fact that it's not, it just goes to show that this like fundamental first experience that changes how girls feel in their bodies, how movement feels, like their, their entire childhood, it's felt one way. And all of a sudden, entire physics and biomechanics change. And then they're making this decision. Is this something I want to keep doing? And we know that half of girls in middle school don't own a sports bra. We know that 75% of them have breast related concerns when it comes to exercise. Um, so for something to have that simple of a solution and yet be like, nobody's, nobody's addressing it on a collective basis, right? There's nonprofits like bras for girls and there's other kind of passionate individuals trying to help with this, but breast education and free sports bras for everyone in middle school would be the first step. Um, and then, and menstrual um, cycle education for anyone that coaches female athletes of any ability. Um, and then if you're coaching older female athletes, like menopause, like just understanding that we have a different hormonal and internal experience. We have a different performance wave of improvement. Um, and we have historically looked at equality as giving women what men have the way they have it. 
Um, we excluded them for a really long time. So now let's make it equal. We'll give them what the men have the way they have it. And that means we're winning, but uh, we've been doing it for 50 years now since title nine. And we know that if you give women what the men have the way the men have it, you don't get, they don't thrive at equal rates. And so that's really the argument is just, let's see this group of people. That's 51% of the population as a, as their own norm, instead of a deviation from the norm, they are their own norm and it's not better or worse. Um, and it let's just build around them. And, uh, and I think it's like, when you look at it that way, it's like everything kind of can come into fall into place. It's really just like recognizing this other group and being excited about making it awesome for them. Yeah. Um, you know, that was a really long answer to your question. No, no, it's, it was fantastic. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was long, but it was fantastic. And, and so, um, better you talking than, than me, but I do, <laughs> because it was a couple minutes ago, I do want, to, I'm not fixating, but like it, it, it struck with me or stuck with me that, um, you know, for me, like being issued as a, as a boy, a cup, Mm -hmm. you know, as standard issue equipment, like if you're a boy, like, well, what would be the female equivalent of that? Probably a sports bra, right? Yeah. And so like, that's just a basic asymmetry, yes. right? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty clear when you look at it that way. A lot of people, when they first hear this way of looking at it, they're like, wait, that's right. That's crazy. That's mm -hmm. such a simple solution. And it would change how girls feel in their body, help them adjust to this new body. Um, and then just to kind of talk about, you know, you asked me more directly about my experience and I kind of just talked more generally, but once I got to be more and more competitive in the sport um, and there were these ideals of what excellence looks like, what an excellent body in sport looks like. And that too has historically been based on what an excellent male body looks like, a, a peak performance male body. Um, and it tends to be, you know, leaner, especially in that like age 16 to 22 adolescent years stage. Um, and that is the opposite of what a developed adolescent female body should be doing for most of us if it's healthy. Like we are, we should be going through a puffy phase. <laughs> um, but instead, we're pathologizing mm -hmm. this natural thing happening to female bodies, and because it looks different than the excellence on the on the boys' side, and yet we're trained, you know, coaches are training these athletes, and they see both groups, but the female bodies are not responding the same way. And what we've been doing instead of looking at and saying, "Oh, that's a different way that excellence looks," that's just how excellence looks at this age. Mm -hmm. We start saying things like, "You you shouldn't be eating ice cream. You shouldn't be eating cookies." we start policing their diet um, or making comments that make them feel there's something wrong with their body when realistically their body's just going to going to go through this natural shift and it would lean out as they got more and more years of experience and it, and once they get through the end of adolescence which is mid-20s that's just a natural progression and, but we just haven't studied it we haven't appreciated it as its own norm and so um what we end up with is a huge number of women um going to war with their bodies mm -hmm. when there's nothing wrong with them yeah you'll even see like pathologizing of girls mental game they'll be like uh oh well you've you've you're slowing down and we don't know why it must be that you're not as motivated anymore or um you need to see a sports psychologist and it's like no there, there's nothing wrong between their ears they just need a year or two to like plateau or even get a little bit slower and and while their body adjusts to these mm -hmm. new norms and then they'll take off again and but because we aren't meeting them with that support during that time a lot of them end up um developing eating disorders injuries um a dislike for the sport they used to love mm -hmm. uh, and and it's all avoidable yeah i, I think you're making a, a very important distinction between equality and equity um this is something my uh, college uh, sociology professor ha harped on. It's like, um, you know, if you give uh, girls and, and, and women athletes uh, what of the way they've had it, well, well, that's equal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but mm -hmm. is it equitable? It like, exactly. well, it's only equitable if girls are boys and women are men. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but they're not. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And I understand why we went that direction. Um, you know, before the second feminist wave in the 70s, women were not really viewed as people, right? In order to 
gain the f- the full humanity to like be able to have a credit card, to file for, for a divorce, to like do a lot of the things we take for granted right now, have a sports team. Um, and these are just a few of the things. The, the successful strategy ended up being we need to appeal to the people in charge and say, we're just like you. You think we're really different, but we're not. We're just like right. you. Yeah. So we're very, we're like, and we are way more alike than we are different, right? right? But we've overemphasized the similarities in order to gain um, rights and access. And, and, um, and even a lot of women ourselves don't even haven't, don't have a full appreciation for those differences. Like that's part of my book too, is showing that what happens when you've been told that you're the same as everything everything should be the same with you and your your male neighbor and your male peers like you can do anything they can do no matter what if you believe if you're taught this myth then you go through the real world and you're experiencing the real world and it, it doesn't end up it doesn't it's not happening for you um it's like this myth is being kind of broken around you you feel like there was like a false promise um and so i think we, we're just it's like the appropriate time in history to be able to recognize difference in a safe way and to say hey yeah we are different and that's okay you, you can we trust you not to use that against us, but instead to like be on our team here and want us to thrive? Yeah. Um, you know, I was going to save this question for the end, but, uh, but I'm not. Um, so I'm just, you go, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking about like, um, the, the way I was, I was brought up. So I was, I was very fortunate to have a really healthy model of, um, you know, male, female relational dynamics, like in my nuclear household, like my, mm-hmm. my father, who's, who's still living, um, really respects women. He, and he just oh, oh, like, he, he, it was just very obvious and it was all I knew. And so I just mm-hmm. sort of inherited that. And yet, you know, that being the case, you know, I, I get into coaching and I, I just do, I think I have kind of a, like an ingrained, I, I do think that women are people, but, but, one, <laughs> but, but, you know, I think I'm, I, as a coach have been as guilty as just about any well-meaning coach of doing the equality, not equity thing. It's just like, mm-hmm. well, because I respect you, I'm, I'm going to give you the yep. same shit I'm giving the dudes. And yeah. Like, and yeah. that's, that's not good enough you know, well-meaning, but like short of the mark, right? Yeah. And if, I mean, I think that's extremely normal. And uh, but that's that's what we've been prepared to do. That That's what the good guys do, right? That's how we've been looking at it. And I think that's okay. It's really just about when you know more than you, then you pivot and you shift. And as long as people are willing to do that, then we're all going to be great. How important do you think it is um, for at least um, maybe it could, change or maybe maybe not um but where we are today like how important is it for um girl athletes and women athletes to have their own spaces you know that are that are just theirs and as like a a coda to that do you think it's actually also important for boys and men to have their own own spaces yeah i do i think that it's really important to have because we do live in a world where gender matters um, and sex matters. Like if that changes, then, then I guess it won't matter. <laughs> but these affinity groups of people who can understand what it's like to walk through the world. Um, because if you're a man and you're walking through the world, you're perceived as a man, you're treated as a man. Um, and it, like if, the, if you have an idea of the kind of man you want to be and, and like there are norms in masculinity that make that hard to do, um, you want support right and i think that the best place to find that is with other men uh to look to like good strong leaders in your community to like build strength together with your friends to shift the culture of of how you do masculinity together and the same thing for women and femininity and obviously we all have masculinity and femininity inside of us um and and so i think but i think that we we need those groups of people where we feel like they know your lived experience they've walked in the similar shoes um and and then you can be, then and then we also really need spaces all together. And that's one of my favorite things about the sport that we love mm-hmm. in running is that you do like rub elbows and shoulders with mm-hmm. people of all genders. And um, I think of all the sports, we are the most poised to like embrace equity 
and like go to bat for each other because we do run alongside each right. other. Yeah. Um, even if the top, you know, the top uh, people in a road race, foot race are going to be men, um, there's still like so much intermingling and care and true genuine care for one another. Yes. Um, uh, and I, I want to call myself out. I, the last question I asked was in very binary terms and I apologize. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, but you know, the, we were really are focusing on girls and women here and that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, Can you horn in a question here from, no, uh, all only my questions. <laughs> <laughs> Were you just going to ask like the best one on your list too? I bet. No, they're all okay. the best. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it goes with what we're talking about, but we have a question from um, JW who's watching and he's wondering um, about what training and education you would suggest or recommend for coaches. Since you mentioned that, you know, coaches should have education on the, the moment the yeah. cycle, for example. So do you have any like spots that coaches or even athletes could just go to? Well, what we need is something that is like nationally and internationally recognized mm -hmm. it, with experts, you know, like something in the lines, maybe something that could live within safe sport, for example, um, or like the USATF coaching systems or some, whatever, so certifications, something that that can be trustworthy but we don't have that yet mm -hmm. uh, and but there you can what you can do now is you can follow certain accounts that are doing really good work in that area like wrcc the women's running coaches collection coaches collective um they have great seminars they have like a coaches um like get together they do a lot of focus on coaching women and female body people and then stanford faster on instagram i think it's f-a-s-t-r they pump out content studies on on female athletes their physiology performance um like i think just the best you could kind of hope to do right now is follow people like that and just give yourself like a, a daily or weekly drip of what's coming out and um dr kate ackerman's work is is totally industry leading um but um, yeah I, I would love to like create an official certification program uh, with the stamp of approval that's like you've got the basics down now go forth and but we don't we just don't have it well we might be circling back with you after this call <laughs> yeah we should talk let's let's uh, let's get something I don't going know if matt's gears are turning but mine are <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yep um, <laughs> um so i should this is uh this is Poor fact checking on my part, but I'll just ask: um, Did uh, did good for a girl win the William Henry William Hill Sportsbook of the Year award for twenty twenty three? Yeah, yeah, it was the first um, memoir by a woman that has won the Sportsbook of the Year award. Yeah, and I think only three female authors had ever won in the forty year history or whatever. Yeah, so that that is a huge. <laughs> huge accomplishment um you know i Thanks. i have written 34 books <laughs> <laughs> you're amazing <laughs> one of, one of which was long listed for the prize you won with oh, your first nice. and only book <laughs> <laughs> well you know sometimes you just hit it out of the gate i don't know what <laughs> I think that the timely, I think that there's a lot of, um, I think there's like a moment happening right now that my book aligns with that's, that's cultural and international in the way that we're, we are, like I was saying earlier, we're at a historical moment where we're ready to think about difference without using it against people. I mean, we are still doing that. There's things like that happening every single day uh, in our country and in the world, but, and, and I have some big examples globally right now, but um but I, but at, alongside that, we are paradoxically we we also have the capacity to hold difference and um, and move forward positively better than we than I think we ever have, especially with regards to women and um, and so yeah I, I think I just wrote a book about that with very that that spoke to people like you know you said that thing about um, 
you realized you'd messed up when you were reading it. Like, I think there's all of us, myself included, when writing it, it was like, wow, there are a lot of ways that I've been complicit in this and, and making it worse without realizing it. And and so I think that when you, if, if you have something like that, that comes at a time when people are ready to hear it, then, I, then that's why I think it resonated. Yeah. I mean, to, to be clear, although jealous, I do, <laughs> I do admit your book deserved to win the award. Uh, oh, thanks, to, Matt. Yeah, because it's it, nice it, of you. Yeah, it's, it, it's really good. And I think, you know, one of the reasons it is, um, is that it, it feels like a book you had to write. You know, when there's that kind of sense of urgency, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that is a very winning quality, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so is that how it felt for you? Like it was, a, it was, yeah, uh, yeah, you had to do. It, it, it did. It, it was, um, I was like, while you were saying that, I was thinking like, man, there's a, a real emotional toll and price to writing those kinds of books. When you feel like you have to write them, it's like they own you until you get them done. And my whole, like my personal life and my mental health and everything kind of crumbled while like kind of just the book felt like an exorcism in some ways, <laughs> like get it out of me because, um, because frankly, like going through a system like that, once you can see the problems, it was very painful. And, and then, you know, there's stuff about my dad, my relationship with my dad who I lost and, um, and other things like that. So it was just, it was a lot of challenge in pulling that out and um and so it, it does feel really nice to have it landing well with people moving them to think and feel differently about things yeah so uh you had to write the book but but if you hadn't um you would have needed some other outlet you know for for the mission you are on uh so just as an exercise um mm -hmm. i mean you coach, like, is that enough? It, you know, like, is that like a similar kind of outlet? It's just more like microcosmic. Um, yeah, that's what the way I started. I was like, okay, now I see what these problems are. I'm gonna do it differently. And I'm gonna do it with this test group of people. And I'm gonna see if um, centering women's health and like adolescent development, late adolescent development will still be compatible with performance. If there is a second rise on the female performance wave that we can really count on if we nurture people through, through that awkward stage. And, um, and it, and I did that for eight years and I feel like the test proved itself out with that group, the best that it could. Um, in my final year of coaching, all seven of my track athletes made the Olympic trials and ran personal bests, which is like, there's definitely luck involved in that too, but it was, um, it was very affirming. And I was, I was trying, the book was a way to say, I can't coach more than this many people. I've got two kids. I have other interests besides coaching too. And I don't want to try to blow up a coaching practice. That just wasn't something that I want, that I wanted to scale. Mm -hmm. um, but a book seemed like the best possible way and the most effective way. I guess I could have done podcasts or some other thing, but I just didn't think we could really make change unless I could get somebody and sit them down for like nine to 11 hours and let them get them invested in one person, see them as fully human, kind of take on some of their dreams with them and then watch what happens when you send them through the system. And I think that you can't capture that in an essay or a podcast the way you can, when you can sit them down for nine to 11 hours. Um, and so it, it just had to be a book mm -hmm. in the end. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. What, what would you say are the universals of actually first question, but, but we talk about like, you know, community, wonderful word sounds nice. Um, but like for the performance focused athlete, why should they care about community? Like, you know, like, you know, why does it really matter you know, to, you know, to be able to you know, not just run in a silo, but be a part of something bigger than yourself. Well, I mean, I'm, 
uh, like Brene Brown is a big influence on me and she, she likes to say that we're wired for connection, just like our neuro systems that that's as human beings, we are wired for that. And there are consequences to not being connected. Um, and then I also just really believe we're here to love. And the more time I spend on the planet, the more I believe like that is the purpose of being here is to love. And there's a lot of ways love can look. It can look like coaching. It can look like going for a run with someone. It can look like listening. Uh, and I believe that running is a place, running community is a place where you can love a hell of a lot. You can invest in people and have them invest in you. You can feel like you matter to somebody, um, to somebody's and um, and then every day you have an opportunity to show up for them. And I think that that's really beautiful. So I think that it's just like, it's a really lonely life to go at it alone. It's unsustainable. In the end, you can't feel, I, at least my, I would argue from my experience, even when you're successful and you're winning and you're getting your goals met, even in that unlikely scenario where that happens, you are incapable of feeling the joy of that at full capacity mm -hmm. if you haven't been practicing feeling joy on a reg and love like on a regular basis as part of your practice and preparation you're out of shape to feel yeah. love and joy you do are you know and yeah. so you'll do it and you see it when you watch the olympics or some of these top competitions there's the athletes that kind of win and they look they don't even look happy days and um <laughs> yeah and uh and then there's the ones that that it just beams out of their face. Like I think about mm -hmm. Alephine, right? Alephine just beams love and joy. And mm -hmm. if you know Alephine, that's how she is in real life. Like she builds community. She invests in people and, uh, and the, her, any space she goes in is better because she's there mm -hmm. and they're drawn to her. Right. And I think we all have the ability to, to, to do that, to contribute in that way. And it comes back, it comes back in, in the way you can feel the joy of your, uh, accomplishments at whatever scale or level they are, whether it's completion of a distance or hitting a certain time or winning the Olympics. I mean, it, yeah, it, 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 it will come through. Yeah. So you, uh, you kind of anticipated my next question, which was the question I was going to ask before, which is, um, you know, what are the universals, um, for building community? Um, or just, you know, creating an environment where those needs are met and then performance gets to go along for, for the ride, you know, whether it's, you know, like a, you know, a, a single sex group or a mixed sex group, like what are the things that always work or just foundation? Yeah. I think safety is huge. People can't, if you don't have safety, you can't feel grounded. If you can't feel grounded, you can't be vulnerable. And if if you want closeness in community, you have to have vulnerability, right? And so you, it starts with safety. So I think, and 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 that can and groundedness. So I think like consistency. Are people showing up where they say they're going to show up? Is there like leadership as far as the time and place? Do we know what's going to happen? That and so you can kind of have a calm body when you show up. Um, and then do you? And then I think like. Um, really going out of our way to make it safe for different kinds of people, like whether people outside the, those that would feel that would naturally feel safe as showing up uh, people of color, trans people, queer people, um, people with varying levels of disability. Like if you really truly want like all of the riches of a, of a community, then having a welcoming space for people that come from lots of different walks of life is going to make that the most beautiful and um, enriching. And so I think that that, that aligns with safety. So that's like a, kind of one universal. And then I think um, watching how we talk about ourselves, like a lot of people will say, obviously, obviously you want to watch how you talk to each other. Or, and if we're talking about grownups, we should all have that down a little better than like middle school or teenagers, right? But, um, but we don't, we don't necessarily all have that down how we talk to each other. Um, but really like I, I encourage people to go a step further than that and really look at how you're talking to yourself. And this comes out in my book a lot in re regards to body image, but it can, it can be about anything else. So if you're like tearing down your own body, talking about how you gained weight or you fat or whatever it is and, um, and how, and verbalizing things about how you'll only be happy when you look a certain way or weigh a certain amount, or you, you know, people that, that are around you are listening and they're hearing the way you judge yourself. And then as a result, they're going to feel like, you, you would also judge them just as harshly as you judge yourself. Mm -hmm. 
And so even if you aren't calling anybody else names, you're calling yourself names, that's the effect it has on, on other people. Um, so I, yeah, watch how you talk to yourself. And, and then like, I think call like um, a good way to be in community when you hear someone talking negatively about themselves is to try to stop it like in a kind and loving way. Like, ah, it hurts me to hear you talk about one of my favorite people like that. Like, as in, like, if somebody's tearing themselves down, I think that's a really loving way to kind of, mm -hmm. like, get them to stop. Because they wouldn't talk to you that way. And so if you can kind of shift them into that thinking, yeah. that can really help. And teams can, and communities can become more um, formal with it. Like, kind of have, like, community standards or agreements or, like, values. Oh, here's the, here's the kind of space we're trying to create. Here's, like, five words that epitomize that space. Mm -hmm. And these are our guiding principles. And, like, when we show up, are we, are we, doing what we can to have these five principles like define the space and um, you can always come back to those. So, but yeah, I don't know. That That's, that's probably not enough, <laughs> but I feel like I've been talking a while. So I might as well give you a chance to ask. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any other ones from your experience? Well, you know, I mean, the reason I said, I thought that you anticipated that question was your talk about um, like our, our purpose here is to love. Um, you know what I mean? So like, that's probably a, a universal too. Like, w wouldn't you say, yeah. I mean, I, I feel that yeah. way, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And then, and I guess that's kind of like in those ways that I was talking about, those are ways to love, right. To mm -hmm. create safety for people and to, right. um, to help guide them to be kinder to themselves, to guide yourself, to be kinder to yourself and, and, uh, and yeah, just love them up. Like, yeah. <laughs> why not conspire together to make our communities like places where everyone feels so much better when, when they when it's time to go home? Like, why wouldn't we want to do that if we're going to spend the time anyway mm -hmm. together? Let's make it awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, you know, it, it's such an important point and it's very validating for, for me to hear that for, from you because like, you know, it's just weird. Like, you know, sometimes like, being open about love is like talking about death. You know, it's just like a, like, it's just like a buzz kill for people. Or it's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> it, it makes mm -hmm. people like kind of awkward and, and cringy. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, like, I just like, that's how I, I view coaching. It, it's like, yes, you know what I mean? It's like, not only is there nothing wrong with it, but there's like everything right with it. Um, it's just like, you know, it's not, everyone's completely ready for it. You know, you know, like new athletes can be a little bit wrong footed by a, by a coach. Um, you know, you have to massage the message, right? So people don't think mm -hmm. you're a creep or, or, or whatever, yeah. but, <laughs> but just, we're talking about, yeah. agape, we're talking about agape love, you know, just like yeah. the, you know, love for your fellow beings. Um, absolutely. Like just like taking them as they are, like as a coach, you absolutely have to do that to be a good coach is to like, you have to love the whole person that comes to you. Um, even as you see them getting in their own way, even as you see like the, the, the like parts of their understanding that are missing that you need to help them with or whatever it is, like you just love them up and, and you don't have to be a coach to do that. You do that with your friends. I mean, it's a, yeah, like you say, it is kind of a, like, we've been taught it's a very gushy word, but um but it is essential. And I think coaches are some of the most loving people on the planet. That's what gets you into it. It's certainly right. not the money or like the fame for 99% of us, unless you're Tara Vanderveer or whatever. It's, um, <laughs> it's about like those human connections. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm talking to you from uh, Dream Run Camp in in Flagstaff, Arizona, where it's just like this cool cool operation where like I run out of my house, my wife's in my house, and we just have strangers come stay with us and just have like a a running experience. And, and one thing that I have found, you know, because I've done a lot of remote coaching, but like this is just different. You know, I'm, I'm living with mm -hmm. these folks. I, I got a guy. That's who, amazing. Yeah, I got a guy who's going to be here for eight weeks, and but like people are just filtering in and out. It's like a flop house for runners. Uh, and we're getting more international. Um, got a, a Dutch runner who just checked in like, like one fifteen in AM last night to let her, in, let her in the door. But like, Oh, wow. God, God bless you. You're welcome. But um, all this to say, like one thing I've noticed and cause we've had, you know, maybe like 40 runners come through here um, so far. Um, and, a lot of them, what, what, what they 
what they like about the experience they have here is the sense of, of community and, and, and they have a contrast, which is where they like reality, like the reality they left to come here and the reality mm -hmm. had to have to return to. So it, it, it seems to me just based on like my current perspective that like a lot of runners are kind of starving for community. Um, not all, yeah. you know, but, but a lot. Um, and so, um, I don't want to put you on the hot seat with this question, but like, do you have any advice for athletes who just feel isolated or just crave community, but they don't have, they haven't found it yet or just the right fit, like other than coming to dream run camp, like what can they do? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I think that's one of the, like some communities have a training group. Like we have one called Cork that's run by Max King, Central Oregon Running Club with a K. It's very cool. <laughs> um, and he's been doing it for years, one night a week at, at a time of day when people who work full-time jobs can show up. And he's building a beautiful community. And I think that's one way to do it. And, and that's what we did in Eugene too. One night a week that people can look forward to. Um, and even if you have a totally different running agenda the whole rest of the week, you come together and you intermingle with this group once a week. It's, it's great. Uh, and then another thing you can do is like sign up for a race with a charity group or, um, or like a local running store, just because they'll create that training camp environment, whether it's six, eight, 10 or 12 weeks. It's very common for a, like a really good locally owned running store to have something like that a couple times a year um, that you can jump in on and that, and like, you'll get plugged in with somebody you'll meet at least one person that you really like and, and whether or not you decide to stick with the group you'll build a connection but i think sticking with the group is worthwhile because you create a set number of time like a set number of weeks that you're going to turn up the dial on your emotional engagement with running that you're going to allow yourself to care a little bit more maybe take a little better care of your body um eat a little better sleep a little better right all those things and not feel bad about it because you have a full life maybe you've got kids you got work you got all these other things and so at, like sustaining community and running year round week after week may not be sustainable for you but for one or two races a year for a block of time it could be do you think that oh yeah sorry i got questions for days <laughs> i gotta fill in where i can um what about coaches that coach virtually? Like we live in this virtual world now. Here we are across the country. Yep. Um, this event even like everything seems to be going virtual. And so if you're a coach and you've got athletes that aren't in your community, local community, how can you kind of engage that community with them? Well, I think that what you could potentially do, and, and this is, going to depend on people's financial situation, but pick maybe a quarterly event or a twice a year event where you invite everybody to come to and, and don't make it one that you have to enter a lottery, you know, like mm -hmm. it could be just like a really cool, um, 10 K in a state that has a long history with it, that you just know it's going to be fun mm -hmm. and fun town to go to and be like, here's an option. We've got an in-person event. We got a bulk discount on registration. Um, and here's a chance to meet some of these people in real life. We used to do that with the Wazal Vole. We'd have a couple events a year that we could get people to rally around. And some people preferred to stay engaged on just a virtual level, but then there were those that like really wanted to come in person and show up to stuff. And, uh, and, and then they like that really boosted their engagement the rest of the year with the virtual programming. Mm -hmm. May I? <laughs> <laughs> yes please post you man <laughs> it, it was a it was a great question uh so glad you asked it um do you do you feel that individual athletes have a responsibility to be community builders um you know we we all thank our lucky stars for the people who are just hubs you know like often they're coaches or they're you know team leaders or club builders or or whatever and like you know like super extroverts just pe people people natural leaders yeah. and you know a lot of them are race uh, event directors too mm -hmm. and like but they're you know they're a small fraction um we we would be lost without them but they're it's like that's never going to be everyone but how about the rest of us um you know it's like it's nice that you know 
I mean, it's, I, I, I've always been kind of like a little bit of a lone wolf type. And, but like, I, I, I got the benefit of immersing myself in a collective, but what is my responsibility to the collective to mm-hmm. be, you know, part of that building process, just as, you know, an everyday athlete. Yeah, well, I definitely think it's a really good topic to think about. Like, you think about um, extraction. I think about like we extract from our communities, we extract from our natural resources, like especially people who recreate. Right? We go use the trails, we use the tracks, we uh, we do that, and we happily um, take advantage of these kind of alpha uh, extroverts that plan things. And and I think that's great. And I do think we have a duty to invest and not just uh, extract, but there's a lot of ways to do that. And I would say that you got to honor the ways that are good for you. It could be like donating to, let's say girls on the run to make sure that there's opportunities for, um, for, for young girls coming through to like be introduced in a healthy way, holistic way to running, or it could be doing some trail volunteer work to, um, trail maintenance in your area. If you, if you have a trail system, um, and whatever the thing is, like, I think if you're a lone wolf type person, you don't have to like start a running group. Yeah. And, and, and if you don't have one of those big time alpha extrovert personalities, like a race director, like there's a, a kind of an introverted painter in my town who just put up these little flyers in coffee shops that said like creatives who run meet at Thursday, 7am at Pioneer Park and <laughs> just left it up in these coffee shops. <laughs> and now there's about 12 or so tops. Sometimes it's two or three. Um, but you just know that if you want to be around some creatives who run, there'll be, there will be at least somebody meeting at 7am. And I would not describe this person as an extrovert and they don't do anything else except provide the date and the time. And then they show up. Um, I feel moved to shoehorn in another way to impact what? Please. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you have expertise. I want to hear it. No, no, I'm just saying like, no, I'm just, just like, this is very self-serving, but like an, an, another way to invest in, um, you know, the thing you extract from as a runner is to donate to the Coaches of Color Initiative, which is, yes. which is an, an 80-20 thing. Uh, and so like, this is like a commercial break, I guess, for the Coaches of Color Initiative, a great way. Um, you know, I, I started it, um, as, as a way to do exactly what you just said. And it, it, I mean, it's, it's perfect. Like I'm, I'm kind of like exactly what you're talking about where I wasn't going to be like a major club joiner, you know, that was, yeah. that, that wasn't my way. Um, but you know, I do it in different ways, but like that, that's one. And, you know, now the organization is way bigger than me and it was just, um, but like, but, you know, to your point, it could be anything, um, you know, yeah, yeah, there's, you know, there's a variety of forms of authentic uh, reinvestment or paying it forward. Yes. But definitely, I think every runner should ask themselves, like, have that little touch point. What am I giving? Am, am I am I giving back? Mm-hmm. That's good. Yep. Um, so now we're back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> <laughs> you should drop the link in the chat so we can yeah. check it out. I yes. want to get to it. That'd be great. Yes, for sure. Um, and then um, my uh, final question, at least on the list for you, um, just in, and this is me talking to you as, you know, you know, a fan, honestly, you know, like I, I followed your career very closely. I'm talking about, you know, just com- you know, the competitive uh, part of it, um, you know, rooted for you. Um, and Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, shoot. You know, I'm a geek. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so, like, I'm just curious to know, like, you know, human to human, like when you look back on, you know, you know, for me, like I, I was a very serious athlete for a very long time, like not at the same level, but like, well, in, of performance, but like. A seriousness kind of yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. like it meant a hell of a lot to me and so you know now i'm you know i'm 52 years old i have long covid i can't run i have like you know i'm looking back and then you know for you like you know your elite elite career it, 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 as, as a competitive runner is in is in the rear view mirror, mirror so i'm just curious like you know when you reflect on it like is there a primary emotion 
are like, are there a lot of emotions or is there a consistent oh, wow. primary emotion? Gosh, I, even you just asking me that question, like I can feel my heart. It's like, it's like kind of clenching. Um, and it's a little like my lungs too. So there's a lot in that question, right? Um, it's a huge mix. I think there's like sadness sometimes when I think back to how the times when I was really singularly focused to the detriment of my mental health or like the things I missed, you know, I'm the, the friendships that I didn't build or the weddings that I didn't go to or the people, there's the friends I like kind of bailed on when I was so, and it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been to any detriment in my career to just like return some texts and phone calls mm -hmm. and like stay connected to people that I had loved at different stages of my life. And, um, and I'm now in that I'm in my forties and I see people who didn't have careers like that, who have these amazing connections with people from different parts of their life. And they, they, they lived differently than me though. They didn't travel all over and kind of like make their whole life about this goal. So I feel a little bit sad about that. And I feel like, but there's a very few races that stand out as like, huge highlights for me where I'm like, wow, I'm so glad I did that. Mm -hmm. When I look back at that time of my life, I mostly feel like um, it's trail runs. Like I loved being in shape enough to like go on any trail and be able to run it and enjoy myself. Like that is what I miss. I don't have that right now. And um, my friend, Melindy Elmore, she just got named to the Olympic team for Canada. Mm -hmm. And I follow, and I follow her on Instagram. She's my best friend in college. And, um, she, she's going to go to Paris and run the marathon there. So she went with her husband, um, to, for Valentine's day, this huge gift to go and preview the course and run it and have a few experiences on the course. And she just posted on Strava today, um, a picture of her map of her getting lost in a park. And, <laughs> um, and it, I like immediately wrote her back and said, this is what I miss. I miss getting lost in a park with you <laughs> like that. To, like no like having someone that has run by your side so many times that you explore with and she never brings a map she never brings a phone she doesn't have like never brings cash as a backup plan she just puts the pressure on herself to figure it out and she's not <laughs> great with directions and we had so many great experiences of getting lost together and uh, so that's the kind of thing that when i look back on things like that i feel like so much love and gratitude that i dedicated so much of my life to that sport um, for little moments like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, bittersweet is kind of the, the, the word that comes to mind. Like, you know, honestly, I, I don't know if this is like communicated to you by fans, but like, I think as a fan, like that's, that's how I look at your journey, especially like given mm -hmm. that you opened up so much in, in your book, um, it feels like a bittersweet journey like definitely the sweet yeah. the sweet is there then there's there's yes there's the plenty, sweet is there's, there there's plenty of it but there's also yeah. the bitter <laughs> there is there's a lot of lessons <laughs> yeah 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 um but uh i mean uh you don't seem like someone who's uh burdens herself with a ton of regret uh like active, <laughs> active regret <laughs> yeah i don't think so i mean i've I've heard that regret is useful and one should be willing to spend some time in it. I, I can tell a, you it a is. popular yeah. book about that. Yeah. yeah. If you're interested in buying so. regret, I'm selling. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> um, a, I, I don't subscribe to being a bright sider anymore. I think there was a time in my life where there was like this, I felt like if you wanted to chase goals and you cared about being great, you needed to like always look at the bright side and, uh, never regret anything. And I, I just don't think that that's useful or an honest way to live anymore. And so I'm not interested in it, even if it does help you in the short term, mm -hmm. if it does help you in the short right. term, I'm not interested in it. Um, so I think that if I were to say what I regret, I regret in 2004, my first year as a pro um, was when I finally succumbed to the social pressures to be obsessed with body weight and leanness that I had previously watched kind of take down a lot of my teammates and competitors. And I had managed to, as I viewed it at the time, stay above it. Um, and just the fact that it got me, like it eventually got me too, uh, that caused me so much pain in the coming years. Like I still had the sweet, but that's where the bitter really kind of like 
got mixed in from that one decision. And it took a really long time to unwind those behaviors and kind of restore health of a healthy relationship with food and my body and to like really feel like I was living free again, like mm -hmm. I used to as a little kid. Yeah. And that was another part of my why, the reason I needed to write this book, because it wasn't just about like making sports better for girls. And, um, but it's thinking about like, if we don't address that female performance wave, we don't build sports around their normals and like really nourish them through development, nurture them through development, you and you can end up at war with your body until the day you die. You could end up spending a significant piece of the pie chart of your mental and emotional energy tearing yourself down in this one life that you have. And I just feel like if there's anything I can do that could help people see those invisible forces more clearly that are influencing them. And once you can see it and identify it, then you can change it. You can, you can address it and you can like kind of fight back for some of that freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, that, I feel like that really, that's what really got me across the finish line with the book when it was tough to get it done. Wow. Uh, Cool. I feel like we just had a very, very substantive conversation. Uh, <laughs> I do too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Th thank you. And um, yeah, I, I hope that uh, people viewing either live or uh, viewing the recording afterward and posterity uh, feel the same way. I'm confident large numbers do. Um, yeah. Just awesome. Thank you so much uh, for giving this amount of your time. Uh, to us, and um, I'm excited to see. Uh, I will remain a fan, um, and so I'm, I'm, I, I, we are are um, excited to see. You're still a young person. Um, there's a lot, yeah. a lot ahead for you. Um, can't wait to see what uh, yeah. what shape it takes. Thank you, you too, and I just want to thank you for all the work that you do in the sport, and uh, and I I see in you like as our relationships have changed and what we're able to do changes and that you continue to put your heart into it and into the people of the sport. I just like that. That makes me feel good to see you mm -hmm. doing that. I like having you around in the sport. <laughs> um, so thank you for, for that. And thank you for including me in your community here. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> okay. So now we are going to actually do a uh, commercial and Lauren, you're willing, you're, uh... I want to see it. Okay. Oh, what? <laughs> it's going to happen I said, if you want, but here she is wanting to stay. Yeah, there will so, be no uh, heartburn if you just disappear. Uh, <laughs> you <know. Yeah>. um, <laughs> but Matt, I'm going to have you take it away again. This is your baby. Yeah. So do we have actually the video queued up? So Yeah, yeah, I have it queued uh, up. Yeah, I'm, 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 uh, I'm okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to announce that, uh, this, uh, passion project, most, most recent patch, passion project of mine, an online course called endurance mastery is now complete. Um, it's video based online learning experience, a little different from our flagship, uh, flagship, um, 80, 20 endurance coaching certification program, which is multiple instructors. This one's like the Mac show, um, you know, for better or for worse. Um, but like, you know, it was, um, you know, I, I put my heart and soul into it. And like, it was really like me just trying to like, just, it was almost like if I only had one more platform to say one last thing I wanted to say to like coaches and athletes, like this would be like my, my parting message. That sounded terribly morbid. I'm, I'm alive and well, I got long COVID, but I've got years in front of me, but like, you know, this is like, you know, you know, cause I've been at it for a while. I've been, I've been doing this for decades and I have a certain amount of experience and knowledge and certainly some convictions and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and an, an approach, um, that I felt like I'll never bother to go through the work of creating something that was this hard to build. If it's all, if it already exists, like it would be, it's not needed and it would not be exciting <laughs> for me. Like I, I, I like to fill gaps. Um, and so I feel that this course um, does does fill a gap. It's uh, it was created for both athletes and and coaches. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. But uh, we're looking to uh, we're not allowed to say when it's being released. It's going to be released very soon. And we already have an active like uh, pre registration list. Yes, uh, so and then get on that. Um, yeah. That but uh, and then just a quick shout out to videographer Nick Guybe, uh, Flagstaff guy. 
um i've worked with on a couple projects now we have a really good rapport it's just fun it's like you know just find excuses to work with nick that's going to be the trajectory <laughs> of my career going forward but he's the one uh, responsible for the teaser you're about to see um which i think is pretty slick nice love it okay <laughs> here it is how many athletes can say they've reached their full potential squeezing every last drop out of their natural ability i've coached endurance athletes for more than 20 years authored more than 30 books on endurance training psychology and nutrition and i'm here to tell you not many you see it takes more than a good training plan to become the very best athlete you can be much more Endurance Mastery is an advanced learning experience for athletes and coaches that provides a complete roadmap to peak performance. And you know who else measures improvement this way? Endurance Masters. Mastering a sport isn't about being faster than everyone else. The rare few athletes who reach the mountaintop have one thing in common, an extraordinary capacity to control their thoughts, emotions, and actions in the service of their goals to make good decisions with confidence at every decision point. Endurance Mastery teaches everything I know about how to convert 100% of an athlete's natural ability, whether great or small, into actual performance. Not 90%, not 99%, 100. In this 20 lesson online course, I'll guide you through all five stages of athletic development from nervous newbie to confident expert, covering everything from maximizing motivation to overcoming fear to developing your own personal optimal training style. Not all athletes care about reaching their full potential. Not all coaches care as much as I do about helping athletes of all abilities become true masters of their sport. But I have a feeling you do. Are you ready? Let's go. Yay. Yay. <laughs> well, that's um, exciting. Congratulations on the on the near launch. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. and we we link to the waitlist in the chat. Um, so if you do want to be first to know about early bird pricing and the release date and everything, sign up for that in the chat. Um, but Lauren, we're now we're really keeping you for too long. I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll uh, I'll go get some dinner. But thank thanks again, and good luck to you with the rest of the event. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Lauren. Take All care. Right. Bye.